Hi everyone, this is Anne Hernandez of the Bellatrix podcast on Spreaker, on Stitcher, on iTunes, on Google Play, on CastBox, also the Bellatrix channel on YouTube and on Facebook, Bellatrix at Global Blitz. How are you? I am so excited, so, so excited today for our continuing study on Genesis, the book of beginnings. And today we are going to study Genesis 12 to 15. We will focus the bulk of our remaining study on Genesis on the life of Abraham and his descendants, which comprise around 75% or three quarters of the book. The first 11 chapters dealt with the ancient history. And now the rest of the book from chapters 12 to 50 will be focusing on the lives of the patriarchs, the foremost of which is Abraham, who is called the father of the faithful. Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 14 and the friend of God James 2:23 I will read from James 2:23 which is our central theme of this study and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed or accounted unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God wow to be called the friend of God. Abraham, along with Daniel in the Bible, were the ones who were titled or called the friend of God. And also, Abraham in that famous faith passage in Hebrews 11 is the father of faith or the father of the faithful. And I really, really want to encourage you to jot down the passages that I'm speaking, that I'm saying, and study this awesome passages at your own time. I want you to read them and to pray for the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to understand this amazing truths because it's just amazing. I mean, you will be blown away by the, uh, the fact that our salvation or justification is based not on anything else, not Abraham's justification was not anything else but by faith. So, um, in the previous podcast, we traced the genealogy of Abraham, of course, from Shem. And today we will look at his family tree from his father, Terah. So, we will kind of break down the family tree of Terah from which Abraham came so that we will see, you know, how they are all related to each other, you know. Um, in this family tree because the focus now has been um, the spotlight now out of Noah to Shem and now from Shem or Faxad and so on to Peleg and now to the family of Terah and out of this the Messiah will come so it's getting more and more specific so Abraham is mentioned 74 times in the Old Testament and he's venerated or highly esteemed by not only the Jews, ladies, or the Christians, but also by Islam, the Muslims. And of course, like I said before, the foremost doctrine of justification by faith apart from works is not a New Testament revelation, but has been mentioned in the Bible in the very first book here in the passages of Genesis that we will study. And we will see that the apostles, Paul in Romans, in Galatians and the Apostle James cite Abraham um, and the passages here in Genesis in their discussion of this very, very important doctrine of justification by faith. So if you have your pens and papers, I would like for you to jot down Romans 4 verses 1 to 25, Romans 4, 1 to 25, Galatians 3, 6 to 18, Galatians 3, 6 to 18, and James 2, James 2, 21 to 24. And add to that, of course, is Hebrews 11, 8 to 14. Hebrews 11, 8 to 14. Please study them at your own time. Amazing, amazing um, revelations from God. I mean, it will just blow your mind away how from Genesis, you will see that our justification has always been by faith, nothing else, even back in Abraham's time, as you will see. So, um, 
uh, like I already told you that, and this October 31st, October 31st of this year is the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. I didn't call myself a Protestant, by the way, but it's important for us to understand um, what was the history behind the Protestant Reformation. And I add this as a side note to our study, uh, an important one, by the way, because what um, uh, the, Protestant Re the Protestant Reformation arose from the realization of the truth of this important doctrine of justification by faith alone. So the 31st of October each year, okay, is being commemorated because on that day in 1517, Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, by the way, at that time, he nailed his famous 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And his act was to prove to be the spark that ignited the Protestant Reformation. And what is the Protestant Reformation? It was a rediscovery of the central message of the Bible that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And as history shows, it's, it is said that the Protestant Reformation was the greatest revival of biblical, biblical Christianity since the days of the apostles. And so Martin Luther, the one who started this, ignited this Reformation, um, came to this life-changing discovery, okay, that the righteousness which God requires is a righteousness which is freely given to unrighteous sinners. When he came upon the verse Romans 1 16 and 17. And what does Romans 1 16 and 17 say? I will read to you For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, oh God, these are amazing truths that we are about to learn from your word. However, Lord, without your Holy Spirit to guide us and instruct us and to convict us, Lord, our attempts at studying your word are for naught. So we ask, Lord, that you will imprint in our hearts and our minds your truth and sanctify your truth in us and help us to understand and apply them into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we will now trace Terah, Terah, the father of Abraham, his family tree, to better understand all these relationships between the different characters that we will be studying in the rest of the book of Genesis. So Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Did you know also that Terah had a daughter? And this is by another wife, by the way. So that daughter is, ta-da, Sarah or Sarai. So Abram, Nahor, Haran, and Sarai, they're all siblings. Well, Sarai was from another mom, but they're all siblings. And so Abram married his half-sister, Sarah. And out of that union came Asa, Isaac, of course, the promise, the child of promise. And of course, there's also that other son through Hagar, the Egyptian slave of Sarai, and that is called, the name of that son from that Hagar slave girl is Ishmael. So now let's proceed to Nahor. Nahor, the other son of Terah. Nahor had many kids. Bethuel, Oz, Boz, Kemuel, Kesed, Kazo, Pidash, Pildash, Jedlaf. But we will focus our attention on Bethuel. I believe this is the firstborn. Because Bethuel, the son of Nahor, which is now the, the uh, nephew of Abraham, had two children. Bethuel had Rebekah and Laban. Okay, take note. Rebekah, does it ring a bell to you? Laban, does it ring a bell? Because Rebekah will be marrying Isaac. 
and out of that union will come Esau and Jacob and out of Jacob well let's let's uh, stop right there because I'm going ahead of myself okay so Bethwell had Rebecca and Laban so these are now the grand nephews nephew and niece of Abraham so they married Rebecca married Isaac out of which Esau and Jacob came out and now of course um, you have Laban the other kid of Bethuel the son of Nahor Laban had two daughters the two daughters of Laban the brother of Rebecca were Leah and Rachel Leah and Rachel remember it was these two daughters that married Jacob and out of that union came the 12 tribes of Israel well of course these are in, uh, it's also included the the handmaids of Leah and um, the handmaid of Rachel and altogether there were 12 children out of that um, union between Leah Rachel and their handmaids four uh, well four women okay so let's go now to Haran. Haran is another son of Terah. Abraham, Nahor, Haran. Haran unfortunately died prematurely. So he died prematurely. But he had Milka, Iska, daughters, and Lot's son from uh, before he died. Well, he died, but Milka married Nahor, or Nahor married Milka, okay, which is the niece marrying her uncle and then lot of course we know lot because he was hanging out with abraham he will be we will find this lot is uh, to be hanging out with abraham throughout the chapters that we will follow that we will be studying and then they will be split up but um um, kind of like Abram took Lot into his wings because his dad passed away early. But take note, Lot, of course, had a wife. We don't know who was the wife. It might have been a Gentile, somebody um, from wherever. We don't know. It's not found in the Bible. But um, when Lot lost his wife after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, he had no, no, no more wife. He became a widower. The two daughters of Lot, um, you know, they committed incest with their, with their father. And so out of those um, incestual, incestual sexual relationship came Moab from one daughter, who is the father of the Moabites, the enemy of Israel. And the other one from the other daughter. from an Wow. So I've been talking... Um, and I guess uh, I was just saying that um, we will not we will stop our discussion of the family tree or tracing the family tree of Lot to just to end right there because our focus in the last chapters or in the remaining chapters of Genesis will be on this prominent people okay but anyway I, for, um, I forgot to mention of course that out of the um Union, I don't know if I said it, but they ban had Leah, okay, and Rachel, uh, two daughters, and they both were married to Jacob, and out of that were the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. So this is now the basis of the uh, division of the land and, and the succeeding generations of the family of Abraham. Okay, so we will continue now to uh, read from chapter 12, verse 1, and then just go on from there. Chapter 12, verse 1, and so on. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now remember, take note, it said, now the Lord had said unto Abram. So it meant that this call did not happen in Haran, but it happened way back when um, Abraham lived in Ur. 
in Babylonia or of the Chaldees or in Babylonia. So uh, we found out during our daily Bible studies, which I've been posting on our group page, that um, initially the ore came in, uh, the, the call came in ore, but Abraham did not follow. Instead, Terah, his dad, you know, took the family out of there and went to Haran. And up to the point that Terah died there. And when Terah died, that's when Abraham finally um, got out of that land and went to the land of promise towards Canaan. That's where he obeyed. And so it says here that finally um, Abraham uh, followed the call to leave his father's place. But the thing is, did he leave his kindred? Because the instruction was, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Well, who belonged to the house of Terah, his father? Lot. So you will know that Lot belongs to the house of his father. So did Abram leave his father's house? It. I don't think so. It looks like he brought his father's house with him. And of course, his wife, they left and went to the land of Canaan and God said I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed so Abraham's call and the covenant with him, the seven I wills of Yahweh. It says, I will show thee, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. If um, you look at that um, statement, all families of the earth be blessed it doesn't just say only of israel all families of the earth and so in galatians 3 14 galatians 3 14 it says that the blessing of abraham might come on the gentiles through jesus christ that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith so that is the blessing that comes to all the families of the earth from the blessing of Abraham. So this is not only a blessing on Abraham and on the whole um, Israel, the seed after him, but also upon the earth, upon the Gentiles. So finally, Abraham departed, verse 4, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. He oh, wanted to tag along. And Abram was 75 years when he departed out of Haran. And of course, Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, his nephew, and all their substance, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They probably stayed, as what some scholars say, around five years in Haran, okay, before they left for um, the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram. This is the second time that he appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So he appeared to him the first time in Ur of Chaldees. He was a pagan worshiper, idol worshiper called him out of there and then when Abraham finally obeyed and went to Canaan there the Lord again appeared to him and confirmed his um, covenant with him that unto his seed he will give this land where they are in now because they finally went to go to Canaan and Abraham removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel Beth house is a Hebrew for house and El God so he went um, to Bethel and pitch his tent having Bethel in the west and hay on the east and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord that's so great and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south you will find that Abraham 
likes to make altars, which is a great thing because it shows how he honors God. So this is the first time you will see that he built an altar. But as we go along in the different passages and chapters, you will see that Abraham makes and builds altars um, to honor the Lord. And so that's what it says. Now we go to um, that was the first one, the first uh, outline, the first um, num numeral in our outline, which is the call of Abraham, the command of Abraham. And we go to the A Abraham's test, his failure and his restoration, which is found in um, chapter 12, verses 10 to 20. Uh, chapter 10 verse 20 uh, chapter 12 verse 10 and there was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land so where did Abram go I mean there was a famine in the land usually famines if you will study them are signs of testings in the Bible and when Abraham was tested of his faith what did he do what did he do excuse me he went to Egypt he went to Egypt and if you look in the Bible all through the Bible Egypt from the time here up to you know the time of the Exodus even throughout you know the all the rest of the Old Testament Egypt is a symbol of the world read Isaiah 31 verse 1 Isaiah 31 verse 1 if you will read this uh, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. So what comes to those who trust not in the Lord but in Egypt, which is a symbol of the world? Woe to them. That's what it says there. So. What happened was that um, Abraham did not trust that God will provide for him in the place of blessing. Remember, God said, go to Canaan. That's where I want you to be. But he removed himself from the place of blessing, not trusting in God. That's why, you know, this is a, uh, this uh, he failed the test here because instead of relying upon the Lord to provide for him, in the place where God has called him, he put matters into his own hand and went to Egypt because he thought that in Egypt he will be provided for. Okay, so, and what happened over there, verse 11, And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon, therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians, sure enough, saw, they beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen, and he asses and men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why says thou she's my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So now, um, Sarai was a very beautiful woman, considering that she's already uh, an older woman. Remember that um, Abraham, or Abraham was like 75 years old when he... Um, got out of Haran and um, Sarah was maybe uh, like 10 years or so younger than him so she was past retired age at this time and yet the beauty of Sarai was so striking that even at this age you know she was very attractive to the people of Egypt and even of course Abram her husband 
knew that, you know, this is going to bring him trouble. So he lied. Okay. So lack of faith in the Lord and then lying. Lying because, of course, he, uh, the first step of his backsliding was he failed to trust God to provide for him. The next step. Okay, so I, I, I'm scared now that I'm going to get killed because of my wife, so I'm going to lie about it. So that still, at the bottom of that, is a lack of faith, okay? So um, God, however, was faithful and in His providence. And in order, of course, to fulfill His promise of the Messiah, okay, um, He preserved Sarah, Okay, he did not, God did not allow for Sarah to be made the wife of Pharaoh and have a child by Pharaoh. And he preserved Abraham, although Abraham or Abram at this time was, of course, faithless and lying, a faithless liar at this point and deceiver. But God was faithful in that he in order to keep his promise, he uh, he wanted to keep his promise despite the sinfulness of his chosen Abraham here. He did not cause for um, Abraham or Sarai to be, you know, uh, suffer um, any harm while they were there in Egypt. But instead, he took them out. So seeing the initiative of God. So in Abraham's walk of faith, it's always been the initiative of God from the call of Abraham. It wasn't Abraham who, you know, said, Lord, I'm going to go. It was God who called him. And now at this point, when Abraham faltered, again, it was God who initiated, who took the initiative to get him out of there. Showing how always, it's always been God who is faithful and us who are unfaithful. And then we will proceed to, um, well, also we've studied in our daily Bible study about that, you know, uh, Abram was rebuked by a pagan king. Can you believe that? Like, you know, for us, if we apply this into our Christian lives, how would it feel if unbelievers are the ones to tell us, look, you are, look at you, you, you did this, you lied, you you deceive us. You're supposed to be a Christian and you did this to us. What a bad testimony. And what a rebuke. And such rebuke is to come from an unbeliever, from a pagan. Okay? So that's what happened here. And uh, obviously, Abraham failed his test. However, even though that happened, still God had provided for Abraham. And he came out of Egypt with stuff. You will see that in verse 16. He came out with stuff, a lot of stuff. And we will proceed to chapter 13. And we will see how Abraham became wealthy. This is the first mention of wealth in the Bible. Verse 1 of 13. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him. You see, there's always this tag along Lot. Now, it's important later on that we will study um, Lot and the illustration of the life of Lot and the life of Abraham. So let's look at that right now. Um, chapter 13, verse 1. And Abraham went out, of course, it says there. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold, of course, because Pharaoh gave this to him. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel. He went back to the house of the Lord. What um, illustration of backsliding and a return and restoration. Okay, so he came back to the house of the Lord. I like that. Unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Look at that, between Bethel and Hai. So he wandered away, just like some of us wander away. We backslide and then because of God's amazing faithfulness and his mercy upon us and we are repentant and we are restored again to Bethel. We are restored from our backslidden state into a right relationship with the Lord. This is what happened here. And so what did Abram do in verse 4? Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. That is so great. 
this is like a repetition of what happened in chapter 12 verse 8 where he said he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord so Abraham is restored after his period of backsliding and now we will proceed to the other side sidekick here Abraham's sidekick Lot you always see that um, in the passages it says Abraham and Lot with him <laughs> I find that funny, but not so funny when you realize how um, this is now a, like a consequence of Abraham's partial disobedience in bringing Lot with him instead of um, going out from his kindred, you know, leaving all his kindred. He took Lot with him and look what will happen later in verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. Okay, so Lot also had stuff. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. So now there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Parasite dwelled then in the land. All right. So we have Abram and Lot, both wealthy men. They living in the same land, obviously. Um, there's too much stuff they have that um, they could not, I mean, the land itself is not sufficient to provide for the needs of their cattle, you know, there's not enough land, not enough resources, and they started fighting for resources, I guess, so you know how it is, but um, the bad thing about it is become like the Canaanites, you see a little side note here uh, in verse 7, it says, and... The Canaanite and the Parasite dwell then in the land. Why do you think it's in there? I mean, for me, what I'm seeing is that God put that little um, little phrase in there to see that here you have um, men of God, Abraham and Lot. They're quarreling with, with each other. They're herdsmen quarreling with each other. And the Canaanites, the Gentiles are watching them fighting with each other. What a bad testimony. Which is... You know, if we apply this to our lives, when Christians fight and, you know, have uh, bickerings and clashes and conflicts with their brothers and sisters with regards to stuff, you know, I mean, it is a bad testimony for the rest of the world, for the unbelievers. So, and so what happened? What did Abraham do? Okay, so Abraham, obviously, he was chastised. And he was restored to the Lord. And um, he said, okay, in verse 8, he said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee. It looks like Abram is maturing in his faith now. He knew that he, God has promised him all this land and all these things. So he was rest assured. He had faith in that. And so he was free to tell Lot. Okay, he said to Lot, let there no, be no strife. Let's not quarrel with each other, okay? I pray thee between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and, by, and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Look, we're brothers. Why should we quarrel with each other? So this is what we'll do. That's what Abraham said. Is not the whole land before you? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So Abraham took the high road here. It shows his generosity, his magnanimous spirit. And he told Lot, Lot, you know what, Lot? The land is right here in front of us. Okay, take your pick. Take whatever you want. And I'll have the re what's the leftover, okay? So um, th that's what happened, okay? Lot was given the opportunity to take his pick. Which in this situation, who was the, in the upper hand? Supposedly it's Abraham. Abraham is supposed to make the pick because of his, um, first of all, because of his rank. He's the, he's supposedly, he, he's the one that's called into this land and Lot was just a sidekick. But he, he you know, he stepped aside and had Lot take the best of the best. And look at what Lot did, okay? So, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. 
and that it was well watered everywhere wow before the lord destroyed sodom and gomorrah even as the garden of the lord well it looked like a garden of the lord like the land of egypt is so common as unto zoar now if you will see um if you go back to the time when abram was tested and when the, there was the famine and then he looked to egypt because egypt looked like very promising it looked like uh full of resources like the world and um like everything every need of his will be met there but remember the first time abraham failed that test but now the second time the second time lot did right the second time because he was not um after the wealth and riches of egypt or sodom and gomorrah but who failed it's lot lot chose the best of the land even though it says here later on in um chat uh verse 13 that the men of sodom were wicked and sinners before the lord exceedingly so despite that lot knowing that you know the residents of the land were evil and wicked and um, they sh he should not associate himself with them still that wasn't in his mind what he had in his mind is it's a beautiful land it would be great for me for my cattle and all that so he chose based on what he saw okay and so lot chose him all the plain of jordan and lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other so and abram dwelled in the land of canaan and lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward sodom okay when when you read he pitched his tent towards sodom it was not just a literal like pitch his tent towards sodom but his mindset okay his mindset was on sodom like oh uh, you know like um his uh, vision and his heart was set towards this worldly place, okay? And th it was more than that, the, the pitching of the tent towards Sodom. It was much more than that. It was, his heart was already taken. His heart was already seduced by the wealth of the world at this point. And so, you can see the steps of the backsliding of Lot from this episode. First, he saw and then he set his heart okay so that's where backsliding starts you see and then you start if your heart is taken over and so um i told you that we will contrast abraham and lot and this is a type of the battle between faith and sight and flesh and the spirit abraham being the ba uh, between faith abraham is that of faith and the spirit and lot is that of sight and the flesh so abraham walked by faith lot walked by sight and then abram was generous and magnanimous and lot was greedy and worldly so abram looked for god's city lot well his home was in the city that later on was destroyed by god and there was nothing left for him if you will see later in the succeeding passages that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and all that Lot had, of course, went up in flames with it. And so Abraham became the father of all who believe and Lot, perpetual infamy, was his Lot. <laughs> That's a play on words. Abraham was the heir of the world, Romans 4 verse 3. While later on what happened to Lot, Lot dwelled in a cave. You will see that in the later passages. And all his possessions were destroyed in Sodom. What a sorry state. That is our battle between our own flesh and the spirit. Between faith and sight. And I hope that um, we will learn from this passage in scripture. That always between that battle we need to focus on faith. We need to focus on the spirit more um, and not on sight the things that we can see because um remember it's not only that our justification that um is based on faith but our christian walk on earth is also based on faith to walk in faith and not in by sight okay so i will continue reading to you um verses 14 
to 18 where God once again spoke to Abraham and he confirmed again his um, covenant with him verse 14 and the Lord said unto Abraham after that lot was separated from him lift up now thine eyes and look for the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So you see, that's another um, incident of incidents of um, Abraham building an altar unto the Lord of worship worshiping and giving God the praise and the thanksgiving so we will proceed now to um, chapter 14 this episode we're in Abraham rescues Lot the battle of the nine kings so in this battle cha uh, chapter 14 verse 1 it says and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, and Shedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Seboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were joined together in the vale of Sidim, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served Shedar Laomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Kedor Laomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Karnaim. These were the giants there, and the Zorzims in Ham, and the Imims in Shevi, Kariathaim. Wow, it's hard to pronounce. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Enmeshpath, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hasezon Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidim, with Shidor Laomer, the king of Elam. And with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Iraq, king of Elasar, four kings with five. And the veil of Sidim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountains. Okay, so who were these kings? There were nine kings in battle, and um, it says that there's, this is divided. There's two um, groups of kings here. The Shemites from the clan of Shem, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and then Arya, king of Lassar, Shedolomer, and Tidal were from the Shemites. Okay? And those that belonged to Ham, the Hamites, were Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zebom, king of Bela. So these two groups... From two different tribes, Shem and Ham, they had they formerly served Shadur Lamer uh, for twelve years, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled, and so Shadur Lamer was defeated and spoiled the rebels, and then he took Lot. Shadur Lamer defeated and spoiled these rebels that rose up against him, and then he took Lot. Abram's nephew, captive. Now, he is now in Sodom, ladies. You will see that um, initially he just pitched his tent towards Sodom. He was in the plains of Jordan. But now in this episode here, in this passage, we obviously see that now Lot is living in Sodom. That's how he was uh, taken captive because he was in Sodom when Sodom was destroyed when Sodom was taken by Shidor Lamer so you see the stages of uh, Lot's backsliding first he looked and then he uh, 
he uh, the seeing and then the the heart is captivated and then now he is actually doing it he's with the ungodly people of the land okay so that's how temptation and backsliding ends okay starts and ends so anyway what happened after that so when abram heard that his brother now you know brother is a general term um technically he's actually his um nephew but you know brother part of the family he um was taken captive when he found out he armed his trained servants born in his own house 318 and pursued them unto dan and he divided himself against them and his he and his servants and by night smote them and pursued them unto Hoba, which is on the left hand of damascus and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother lot and his goods and the women also and his people so abram rescued lot okay poor lot so he found himself in a strait in a situation in a bad situation he was taken as a prisoner of war and abraham's army consisting of 318 servants came to rescue lot can you imagine that there's like armies of how many kings were there uh let's see um four kings four kings and their armies against lot i mean against abraham's 318 okay well let me just say this that obviously abraham is a very rich guy because we found that out in um, chapter 13 he was very wealthy at the same time he had his own personal army he's got his own militia trained by him 318 so he's a very powerful and influential man because god blessed him here and so he's he brought his army and they conquered the four <laughs> armies of the the four kings and he rescues lot from there okay and his family of course and his possessions he took out he was able to rescue and after that let's proceed to verse 17 and the king of sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of kedor laumer so the king of sodom was the one also that was defeated okay they met he met him and the of the kings that were with him at the valley of shavi which is in the king's dale and melchizedek okay take note of that melchizedek this mysterious person here king of salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high god and he blessed him and said blessed be abram of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth and god and blessed be the most high god now i want you to take note of the title of god here this is the first time it appears in the bible god first we learned was elohim and then he was um lord okay jehovah and now we have god here as the most high god and it's actually in hebrew el elion okay i want you to um highlight that in your mind that, that name of god and he blessed him and said blessed be abram of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the most high god which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand and he gave him meaning abram tithes of all and the king of sodom said unto abram give me the persons and take the goods to thyself and abram saith unto the king of sodom i have lift up mine hand unto the lord the most high god you see that title again el elion the possessor of heaven and earth that i will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet and that i will not take anything that is thine lest thou shouldest say i have made abram rich save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me Anur, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Okay, so what happened after that? After the battle, after the victory, there comes this mysterious person, priest, Melchizedek, king. He was not only a priest, but he was also a king of Salem. 
So obviously, he is a um, Gentile. He brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abram. So Melchizedek here is the type of Christ. We don't know his origins because it just says that he's a king and priest of Salem, that he received tithes from Abram. And there was um, allusions of him in Psalm 110 and Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. And he's called as the king of righteousness, king of Salem, Salem or Jerusalem, and priest of the Most High God. That is, those are his titles and receive tithes. And this is the only mention of him in the Old Testament. Okay. And he provided two elements, the bread and the wine, which if you will look in the New Testament is a representation of the Lord's Supper. Okay. That's Melchizedek, and we could only speculate about him. There's no record of his birth or death, and um, he wasn't Christ, okay? He was not Christ. Christ priesthood, it says here in Hebrews 7, 3 and 15, Christ priesthood was after the order of Melchizedek. So we could deduce from that that Jesus was not here Melchizedek a symbol of Melchizedek so this was a different person was he a celestial being no he was a man Hebrews 7 verse 4 so those are just speculations about Melchizedek he you know we know now that Melchizedek is a type of Christ like I've said before you will see Jesus Christ all over the pages of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, especially in the Old Testament. You don't think that Christ is here, but in every pass, every chapter, every book, well, not every chapter, but almost, you know, in every book, you can find Jesus Christ in the Bible, okay? You find him all over the Bible. And this is one instance when you see Christ. We saw Christ in the ark as a representation. Jesus Christ. Um, in various others, the, um, the, the lamb that was slain, the animal that was slain to cover Adam and Eve. So it, it's so many instances where Jesus Christ is seen in, and you will see more of that later on in Genesis. But this is one other time where Jesus Christ as a representative as a form of, um, I mean, Melchizedek is a type of Christ here, the king and the priest. And you will know that there's only three people, you know, in the, or three groups of people, I might say, who are both kings and priests that are mentioned in the Bible. The first one being Melchizedek. It says here that he was king and priest of the Most High God. And then we have Jesus Christ who is, of course, our king and our priest. And then you will find there's another passage in the Bible um, that says in Revelations 5, 9 to 10, that we, us, God's children, are kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So I will read that to you later on. But anyway, I just want to have a brief discussion about Melchizedek now, okay? So he is a um, type of Christ, the king priest, and this type strictly applies to the priestly work of Jesus after or in the resurrection, since um, Melchizedek presents only the memorials of sacrifice, that is, the bread and the wine, okay? And then I want also to touch on the title of God here, which is the Most High or Most High God, or El Elyon, which means simply, Elyon means highest. And the first revelation of this name is found in verse 18 that we've read. It indicates its distinctive meanings. Okay, Abraham returning from his victory over the uh, confederated kings. Okay, he met with Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, who blesses Abraham in the name of El Elyon, meaning the possessor of heaven and earth. And the revelation of God as being the El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, most high God, um, you know, brought upon Abraham a sense, um, a deep sense of um, God being who he is and blessing Abraham and 
um, causing Abraham not only to to worship him, but to God, but to give a tenth, okay, a tenth of his uh, tenth or a tithe, a tithe to the Lord. It says here, um, verse twenty. Okay, he gave him tithes of all the spoil of the battle. However, in contrast, when the king of Sodom offered um, of the spoil to Abram to get all the spoil from the battle, what did Abram say? He said, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. So that is the response of Abram to the possessor of heaven and earth and most high God. Gives him a deep sense of reverence and a need to offer his um, sacrifices to him out of his possessions. And because of that, he has no need for whatever goods that the king of Sodom, worldly goods that the king of Sodom would offer him. Because he finds his all sufficiency in El. Elion, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And another takeaway from this is uh, from the name El Elion. Remember, the Lord is known here to a Gentile king, Melchizedek, by that name, Most High God. That's how Mel King Melchizedek reveals the Lord most, as, a most, as the Most High God. And his distinctive character as the Most High God is being the possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, so appropriately, this no gentle knowledge of God by his name, Most High, we read that the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam. So it is by this name, the Most High God, El Elyon, that God in Genesis, I mean in Deuteronomy 32 8, please write this down and read it. At your own time. Deuteronomy 32 8. It's by this name, El Elyon, that God divided the land to the nations, meaning to the Gentiles, their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam. So, as possessor of heaven and earth, El Elyon, it was the prerogative of the Most High to distribute the earth among the nations according to whatever principle he chooses okay so you will see that in here you will find that the borders of the nations you know the divisions of the nations this was determined by god himself by el elion the most high god who possessed the heaven and earth he divides the nations according to their borders their lands the peoples and that is his prerogative Okay, and also I will, I would want you to go to um, another verse here, um, just to show you um, um, in uh, Daniel chapter four, verse seventeen, that this title of God is El Elyon is mentioned again, and um, the context of it is I will read. This is now um, Nebuchadnezzar sharing his vision, his dream to Daniel, to Belshazzar. And this is what he said. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men that is a revelation of the nature of god is the most high god to nebuchadnezzar um the king of babylon at that time that's in the book of daniel so i would like for you also to take that down and study it daniel 4 chapter 17 because um these are all related and um you will see that that mention of god is the most high god it, this is the first time the Bible that it is said that revealing his name and all throughout the Bible you will see that name repeated over and over and when it is mentioned it is related to you know the Gentiles and how God you know makes his um, 
his uh the kingdoms of the earth how god divides it among the gentiles among the nations because he's the possessor of heaven and earth so i just would like for us to uh, um meditate upon that because we've been studying the names of the lord and the names of god is revealed the names of god are revealed progressively in the bible as it relates to history and his ways with us and with the uh, with um the uh, men and women of the bible okay throughout the course of history here so he this is the gradual revelation of god in genesis okay and this is the first mention of his name as el elion okay so um we will continue now that we've uh finished chapter 14 we will continue with the last chapter which is chapter 15 and this will be um a discussion or a study of the uh furthermore of the covenant with abraham all right i will read from it and then we'll have a brief discussion and then we'll end our study today verse 15 after these things the word of the lord came unto abram in a vision saying fear not abram i am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward and abram said lord god look at that that's another name of god lord god adonai Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in thine house. Um, where is that? And lo, one born in my house is mine ear. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine ear, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine ear. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Look at that. That's another one. That's another passage there showing the justification of Abraham. He believed unto God, and he accounted, he accounted it to him for righteousness. That's chapter 15, verse 6. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know for surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. So you see here a prophecy to Abraham of what's going to happen to his descendants, that they will be a slave in the land of Egypt. Uh, although it doesn't say Egypt here, but that's what's going to happen in Exodus. Um, that the Israelites will become slaves after Egypt, after Joseph dies and you know they stay in Egypt. Remember, we will study that. And then after a while, you know, um, they became slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Um, actually, in other passages of the Bible, it says 430 years. But the actual time that they became slaves was 400 years. There was a period of 30 years where they lived in the land, but they were not slaves. They were prospered under Joseph and the Pharaoh um, who knew Joseph. But for 400 years, that was the time when they became slaves. And then after that, they will come out with great possession, which is exactly what happened to the Israelites when they got out of Egypt, when in the great exodus, that they were their, um The Egyptians gave them their stuff, okay, treasures, possessions, and all that. So this is, excuse me, actually a prophecy of that time when they will be enslaved in Egypt. 
And the reason that they will be there because the land, the Canaanites, you know, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So we see here that God is still waiting for the Amorites, the Canaanites, uh, sin to reach its full measure before judging them. Meantime, his own people will become slaves in Egypt. Okay. So, and then verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace. And a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kerizites and the Kadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephamims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Now note that when God made his covenant with Abram, and he said that you will have this land. Note that he said that the land will be from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, if you look at the land where um, Israel is now, you will see that that's not, that's not where um, Israel is at. Israel is like a tiny, tiny piece of land here. Um, when um, supposedly the land of their inheritance, which God has covenanted with them, um, consists of the land uh, that goes to a, um, a Syr Syria, and then, you know, close to Egypt, and then um, Arabia, okay? So that's a whole bigger piece of land than where they are in right now. So obviously that's not... The whole land that they have been where they're residing right now israel is right now they are only inhabiting a small portion of the land that has been promised to them by the lord in this covenant right here in the abrahamic covenant um so but in the coming time in the millennium when christ returns um israel will finally be in the land of promise the whole of it but for now they are just in a tiny part of it and <laughs> And the, their surrounding neighbors are trying to expel them from that place, from that tiny place, okay? You see, there's spiritual warfare there for the land. And I just want to say that um, talking about the Abrahamic covenant, I'm going to say that uh, based on Genesis 22, 15 to 18, this covenant is eternal, okay, unconditional, confirmed by an oath, Okay. And you might be wondering, what is this uh, thing, um, what, what is this ritual that Abraham did, okay, about the, the uh, sacrifice of the heifer and the goat, that you cut them in half and then you put them, you know, uh, across each other. Now, this is a common practice back then at that particular time and that particular uh, era, that place, where when you make a covenant with a person, what you're going to do is um, you cut you cut the covenant or you make a covenant or a contract. And what you do is that you would, the participants of the covenant, in this case, two people, God and Abraham, they would divide a sacrifice and together, okay, there's the two parts of the sacrifice. You cut them in two and put them across each other. And the two parties of the covenant will work, will walk around in a figure of eight around the carcass, around the, the, uh, the sacrifice. And that's how you confirm the covenant. But as you can see, this uh, covenant is unconditional. Why am I saying that? Because if you read the passage in verse 10 to uh, verse... Um, verse 12 and later on in the last remaining of the passage you know for verse 17 to uh yeah verse 17 that it was only god god here is shown as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp um passed between those pieces because abraham was asleep okay abraham was asleep and a great um darkness fell upon him and then God appeared and um, 
and stated the terms of the covenant. And then when the sun went down, it was dark. God appeared in a smoking furnace and a burning lamp and passed between the two pieces of the sacrifice, confirming his unconditional covenant. Okay, so Abraham did not walk through the, the sacrifice, the two pieces of sacrifice with God. Only God did to signify the unconditional um, terms of the Abrahamic covenant. So, this covenant was a commitment of the land to his descendants from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. And this covenant involves them being afflicted in Egypt for 400 years. And it has three major promises that in Abraham's seed, all nations shall be blessed. And God's covenant with the nation Israel, if they faithfully serve him, they would pros they'd prosper. If they forsook God, they would be destroyed. That's the second. <clears throat> and the third is God's covenant with David that his family would produce the Messiah who would reign over God's people. And then um, talking about the affliction in Egypt, that after they are afflicted, they will return with great possession. So let me just talk about um, what is going on these days. Because when we look at the Abrahamic covenant, it involves the land, okay? It involves the land. It involves Israel. It involves God's covenant with Israel that they will be blessed if they faithfully follow God. And they will be cursed and destroyed if they forsook Him. And this involves, of course, them living in the land that God had promised to them. And this also involves the coming Messiah. Out of their lineage will come the Messiah, okay, who would reign over God's people forever. Now, there's um, what you call these uh, replacement theology. And the church, many in the church today, uh, you know, promote or believe or foster this replacement theology, which is basically that the church has replaced Israel as the people of promise, okay? That's what they believe. And many Christians, many Christians, and I know the Catholic Church ascribed to this, subscribed to this belief of replacement theology that in these days and in the future, Israel will no longer be part of the covenant, the promise, because we have replaced Israel. That's why it's called replacement theology. But if you look at the Abrahamic covenant, it is an everlasting covenant, which is not only in the Old Testament, but it will continue through the New Testament until the millennia forever. It is an everlasting covenant with Israel. Israel is God's chosen people. And we as the church, the Gentiles included, will never replace Israel as the, 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 the people of the covenant. We cannot replace because the Abrahamic covenant has been promised to them. So um, somehow this replacement theology, which is some Christians and even non-believers uh, believe in, um, is the cause of, of the anti-Semitic anti -Semitic, um, feelings or uh, position of Christians in the church towards the Jews. But I'm telling you that if you look at the blessings and the curses of the Abrahamic covenant, you will be reassured that if you bless Israel, you will be blessed. And if you curse them, you will be cursed. That is the covenant that God has with the people of Israel. I just want you to know that because there's an error that's going out there that um, the church has replaced, church meaning us, has replaced Israel. But no, Israel will continue even to the time Jesus comes to be um, the chosen people, okay? Because he's called the, the God of Israel and he has made his everlasting covenant with them, okay? So we should be on the right side of the promise, we're not on the cursing side, but on the blessing side, okay? So that's how we should look at Israel. And um, I'm going to end our study today 
by reading from great passages here in the Bible. Hebrews 6, 13 to 20 and Revelations 5, 9 to 10. Okay, as we end this um, study on Abraham, on um, the Abrahamic covenant, on the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, faith and sight, on um, the deliverance of Lot, the Melchizedek here, the king of Salem. And before I forget, I must tell you that the name Adonai here in uh, chapter 15, verse 2, represents master. And it's applied in the Old Testament scriptures both to God and to man. But the latter instances are distinguished by the omission of the capital. Okay, so Lord God Adonai is another name of God, okay, that we are finding here. The master, God being Lord God, he has a right to our obedience. And we must be directed by him in service if he is to be our Adonai. Okay, so Moses said unto the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. You will later find out. And so when we serve the Lord, we must always remember he's our Adonai. He's our master and we must follow him. Just like we follow, you know, um, our Lord, our master. We are the servant the same way with the Lord. So that is Adonai. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm going to end this study with Hebrews 6, 13 to 20 and Revelations 5, 9 to 10. Hebrews says, For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, immutability meaning the unchanging, enduring, and permanent of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which impo it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Revelations 5, 9-10 to And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. And it's made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord God, for your promise to Abraham. And from which promise we, Gentiles, are blessed forever thank you so much lord for your justification for the righteousness that is imputed upon us through our faith in christ and also for the promise that we will reign with you as kings and priests forevermore thank you lord that you have not only given salvation to the jews but also to the nations of the world we trust you we praise you we give glory to your name we look forward to the day when all nations of the earth will bow down to that highest name, the Most High God, the King of Kings, to Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. It's been a longer study today, but um, I hope that you gained much from it. And please read the Bible verses that I told you, that I gave to you. Oh, they're so awesome, guys. Read the Word. Meditate on it day and night. And there from which you will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Have a blessed and beautiful day ahead. Bye-bye.